Designing buildings to resist lateral forces can be one of the most complex things that you need to do as a structural engineer. And often when we think about complexity in lateral design, we often only think about earthquake loads. However, wind loading is highly complex in how it affects your structure. So I'll be going through some of those complexities that you need to consider when designing your building for those wind loads, all the way from your smallest building up to your tallest building, to give you a tool chest of some of the considerations that you need to have. My name's Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. When starting out the calculations for wind, you need to first work out that critical design wind speed. And this is all about location, location, location. Wherever you are in the world, the wind speed will vary greatly. Obviously, the closer you get to the equator, the higher the wind speeds get, as you're more affected by large tropical storms or cyclones. So you need to work out where your building is located and what is the critical design wind speed. There'd generally be some guidance from the local municipalities about the design wind speed that you need to design for certain locations. If you don't have a municipality that's giving you those critical design wind speeds, you will need to do a little bit more digging and data collection and generally you perform what is a Monte Carlo assessment so you get the critical design locations around you and performing additional analysis on it to predict those critical storms. After calculating that critical design wind speed the next thing that you need to consider is the terrain around your building. As the rougher the surface is, the slower the wind will be. And this is due to turbulent flow and the Reynolds number. When you think about air flowing across a rough surface, the rough surface is applying friction to the airflow essentially slowing it down. So I'll break this down into a number of categories and the lower the category is, the higher the wind speed will be. The first one is like a terrain category one, which is a very open terrain, not many trees, essentially treeless, poorly grass terrain. So it's essentially a flat surface. This will not slow down the wind very much, leading to the biggest wind loads. The next one is a ter terrain category 1.5, which is where you've got those big open sources of water. So if you've got big oceans or bays that are greater than 10 meters, where essentially waves can form in the water. These waves roughen up the surface and slowing down the wind slightly. When moving into a terrain category two, this is your open fields or grass fields. So you've got some scattered buildings here and there, not many, about one or two per hectare. And so you've got essentially fields or farmland and not many trees, so not much to roughen up that surface. When we're moving up slightly, again, we've got an intermediate plane. So we've got a terrain category two and a half. This is very similar to your terrain category two, but slightly more dense. So you can get up to about 10 buildings per hectare. So maybe you've got some trees or other elements that are slowing down the wind load and normally buildings up to about 10 meters. These could either be buildings or trees. Terrain category three, this is really where we're starting to move into the suburban land. So we've got quite dense housing. We've got buildings no more than about 10 meters or established industrial estates. And the last and final category is terrain category four. If we can think about these central business districts, so generally we've got buildings of around 30 or more meters. So it's more those central CBD areas is where you're going up to that TC4. And this is where you'll have the lowest wind speeds. To ensure that your building doesn't get blown away, don't forget to click the like button. Not only does it help me out, but it also allows this to get out to more people. When we're thinking about those local categories, it's not just the area immediately around the building, but you need a certain distance for that terrain category to take effect. And this is typically about 40 times the height or up to around 500 meters minimum. So you can linearly interpolate what terrain category you have around the building based on that height. So you take a distance 40 times the height of the building, look at the terrain category in that area, then work out what percentage of each terrain category is in there and linearly interpolate between your terrain category one all the way up to your terrain category four to work out where you sit on the scale. We all know that wind speed varies based on its height, but it's highly critical based on that terrain category that we just assessed. As the rougher the surface is, the slower the wind is at the surface level. And so as the layers of the wind move up, they're slowly applying friction on each other, slowing down that wind. So we look at that terrain category and we plug it into a number that allows us to assess the wind speed variation based on its height. You also need to consider the amount of shielding you're gonna get from the adjacent building. So if you have a lot of buildings that are a similar height or taller than the structure that you're designing, you can achieve reductions in wind speed, essentially them shielding you from the brunt of that force. This is typically up to about a maximum of about a 30% reduction. However, it does vary based on the density and how many buildings you have around you. On the other hand, there's also factors that may increase the wind load that you need to design for. For example, if your building is on top of a hill or a crest, this can greatly increase the wind load. When you think about it, the wind blows across the surface and the hill corrals the wind up, increasing the wind speed. So this can have a great implication on the wind load that you need to design for, and in some points, increasing the wind load up by 70%. All the factors that we've just talked about is about calculating that critical design wind speed. But wind speed doesn't apply a force to your building. It's more about the pressure that that wind speed applies 
to calculate the force that the structure needs to resist. So when we're thinking about the design, it's all about pressures now. The first and most easiest one in that consideration of that wind load is that windward wall. You think the wind comes along, directly hits it, applying a pressure directly to it. And there will be some local area factors to calculate that pressure that you need to consider. The next one is when the wind goes up and over, the leeward wall also exerts a force on the building. As the wind blows over, it applies a suction force, essentially dragging the building along. So it's a combination of that windward and leeward wall. The wind also blows over the top of the structure. And we're talking about earlier about how terrain categories can affect the wind speed. The roof can also apply a friction force. Although it's quite small, it may be enough to affect the overall lateral force that you need to design for on larger structures. Now, we're all talking about pressure here as well. So another careful consideration is how much pressure is going to get inside the building due to the effects of wind. So if you've got large openings, you can highly pressurize the building, causing the building to expand. So when you're thinking about that load, the windward wall is easy. It's expanding, it's pressurizing away. So it may have a slight reduction on the windward wall pressure. However, on the leeward wall, it has the opposite. As you think about the winds moving away, they're both pressing in the same direction. So that pressurization can have an impact. Now we've got the basics of the overall lateral design we need to look at. The next thing that needs consideration is what load is applied to the roof. The design wind load on the top of the roof is something that can trip some engineers up. As when we're thinking about loads, we're always thinking about down. However, the wind is blowing up and over, and it's much like a wing. So typically, there is a suction force that is applied to the structure. But if your building is very long, you can get a downwards force further back. As the wind essentially rolls over turbulently, it can cause a downwards force. There's also local area effects that you may need to consider in the overall design of your main elements. On bigger buildings, you can have quite large areas that need to be designed for local area pressures. Local area pressures may not only just affect the facade, but overall member design. If you've got a large enough building, these local area pressures can get quite big. As the load is very turbulent, you can have quite high loads in certain locations typically around edges and corners of buildings. So they may need to have consideration of those local area pressures. Now, if you're designing facades, this is highly critical on the design of your facade. But on those bigger buildings, it can also affect your overall member design, such as purlins or rafters. When designing taller or wind-sensitive structures, there is great benefit in getting a wind tunnel test. Essentially, they build little scale models of the building that you're looking for and the surrounding area. And then they apply a great wind force over it to work out the critical design wind speeds that you need to consider and the forces that will be applied to your structure. However, before you get to that wind tunnel testing, you need careful considerations of the vibrations and frequencies of your building. When we often think about how the building is moving modally, we only really think about earthquake. However, taller buildings can be highly critical, especially if they're really flexible. So typically building around one hertz is considered to be wind sensitive as you will get an amplification of those cross wind effects. So when you're looking at a building before you get to that wind tunnel testing, have a careful consideration of the modal and response of the building and how flexible it is. But do you need to stiffen it up before you get into that wind tunnel testing? Because in some situations, really flexible buildings can have an amplification to your wind load. Now, this is most evident in such structures such as chimneys or poles. When you get that wind blowing across it, you can get a big vibration in the structure where the building is rocking backwards and forwards. As the primary direction is not directly on that wind load, but that cross wind effect. As you can see, the design of wind is highly complex. And it would not be to make these type of episodes without the supports on my Patreon that are listed here. And as always, stay safe, keep learning, and I'll see you next week. Bye.